Um, I wanted to do a little bit of a close text reading again, this time of um, the reading on the deeds of the divine Augustus. Um, the Latin words, the res gestae, the things I've done. Um, you'll note that your next project is called the res gestae project. So you might want to pay careful attention <laughs> to exactly what this text is about and how it's written. Um, to understand the res gestae and its contents, you need to understand when it was written. This was written at the end um, of Augustus's life, right near the end, and um, placed um, around the empire as a way of showing the people who Augustus was. This was his legacy. This is what he wanted to leave behind, okay? So these are his words. Um, these are things that he thought were important. Um, and so as you're reading, remember, this is someone crafting their own legacy. Um, so as you go through, you're going to see some themes pop through. And I just wanted to point a few out, and then that's probably all I'm going to do today, so you can get a lot of this yourself. At the beginning, the first few um, points are all about what happened immediately after the death of Julius Caesar. You'll remember that Caesar um, was killed, and what followed was a bit of a civil war um, between, um, well, as Octavian chased down those who killed um, Julius Caesar. Uh, and so these first few are about that. I, I drove the men who slaughtered my father into exile, right? And, and then afterwards, he conquered them in two battles. Um, and you see then the next part is the honors that he was given. And notice the honors are something that are given by other people. But for him, this is a really important statement about how great he was. The fact that people um, celebrated him and honored him is a sign that he was in fact great. So you see things like the words triumphs and ovations. These are big parades and celebrations of his greatness. Um, but he's very careful too about looking like he would, might be power hungry. And that's your reflection question today, and I really want you to think about that. Here he says, the dictatorship was offered to me, and I said no. Um, and later on, you're going to hear that other, other important uh, positions were offered, um, and he turned them down time after time. So I want to make sure that we understand why he might do that. Um, again, here are more honors. The Senate... Um, decreed vows be taken for my health. People were praying for him. His name was included in a hymn as if he were a god, right? Um, all of these things were about how much he was honored by others. Then we get an interesting one that might not have stuck out to you when you were reading this. Our ancestors wanted the Janus Corinus to be closed when throughout um, all of the rule of the Roman people by land and sea, peace had been secured through victory. So this temple, the Janus Quirinus, has these big gates in the front, and they're always, 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 always open. The only time they are closed is if there is complete and utter peace throughout all of Rome's um, controllings. And that's just so rare that there would just be complete peace because there's just so much land that Rome is controlling. Notice that during his lifetime, three times this, these gates were closed. So peace, he is celebrated for his peace. In fact, um, his reign is said to have begun an era known as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, where Rome was, for many regards, at least internally, not fighting with itself, no civil wars. Now, again, might not seem like a big deal, but remember everything that led to Augustus taking over. It was civil war after civil war after civil war with Marius and Sulla and Caesar, right? So here we've got a time where he is able to be celebrated um, for peace. Then we get his generosity. Notice, time after time, when the government was in trouble, he donates his own money, his own grain, to make sure that the government can still run. Um, you can imagine 
in a world like today, right? You know, we're going through some incredible things where um, it's extraordinarily expensive for the government, and there's there's issues about what what um, what things need to happen. You know, they're talking about trillions of dollars of of money needed to to help with the the coronavirus. Imagine if someone had the trillions of dollars. Now we don't have anybody that has that amount of money that com- could p- completely do what he did. But um, imagine if all of the billionaires were able to donate a hundred billion dollars. You know things like that. This is basically the equivalent of what he did. Time and time again, through his own money, his own wealth, he was able to do this. Notice four times I helped the senatorial treasury with my money. Um, when taxes fell short, I gave out contributions of grain and money from my granary and my patrimony. So that's his inheritance. Um, and then beyond that kind of generosity, there's the generosity of public buildings. He builds beautiful temples, um, the Senate House. You will see this, the Capitol, the theater, all of these public buildings he builds, and a lot of them with his own money. Um, so again, this is something he thinks he wants to be remembered for. Um, to help the masses and the people, he threw games, these gladiatorial games that, you, um, that you know, you've seen movies on and whatever else. These are really big for bringing the people together. Um, and he does this again at his own expense. Um, other spectacles, a naval battle, all of these other things. Um, you may remember that Pompey made his name from clearing the Mediterranean Sea from pirates. Well, Augustus does this as well. Um, he also, like Crassus, who was able to stop a slave rebellion, Augustus is able to do that as well. Right? So here's all of these things. And then finally, as most great leaders, he's able to tout his military victories. He extends the borders. Not only is it peaceful within Rome, but Rome is growing throughout this time period. He grows by bringing in many, many, many more regions. Um, And I, I wish I pulled up a map, which I didn't. I will next time. So you can see how big Rome got during this time. Right? So, um... It ends with this final thing, which is, um, at the end, the people chose to call me Augustus, right? And this has become his name. Remember, he was Octavian. They chose to cause me, call me Augustus, and they gave me dominion, right? So this is a transition in power. He, in reality, during this long period, had as much power as anyone has ever had in Rome, right? Um, And this is something that's pretty incredible. However, notice, at this time, look at this last line, which I think is fascinating. He says, after that time, after I'd been given all of this, this is the beginning of what we call the Empire, 27 BCE. After I've been called Augustus, after I'd been given all of the, the kind of imperium, that's the word we get for, um, um, uh, we call him an emperor. Because after this time, I exceeded all in influence. So in other words, everybody listened to me. But I had no greater power than the others who were colleagues with me in each magistrate. So here he is. So one year he would be consul. And theoretically, the other consul has equal power under the law. But during the entire reign of Augustus, he exceeds all in influence, meaning people listen to him. No matter what his legal authority was, he was in fact ruling Rome by itself. By himself, excuse me. Right? This is a shift from the idea of a republic to one man ruling. And yet, on the surface, if you look at it, theoretically, he had no more power than anyone else. And that's your reflection, right? Why on earth would he go out of his way to make it look like he has no more power than anyone else, when in reality, he is running the show all by himself? Think about that. Think about why that might be important. Um, And please shoot me an email if you have any questions about that or anything else. Um, Thank you very much. Hope this was a little bit helpful for you.